Hello, Manchester, and welcome to another edition of Gerard at Large. I am your soon-to-be-returning-to-the-studio host, Rich Gerard. Thanks for tuning in. As you know, you can find us online at GerardAtLarge.com, and you can find us on Facebook and Twitter, also at Gerard at Large, where we encourage you to like us and to, lo uh, and to follow us because we just want to be loved now more than ever. You might want to put our YouTube page on your channel or on your click or whatever it is you want to put it on. Why? Because YouTube is how we are distributing this show since we have to record it and send a recording to the studio so it will be aired. Yes, our YouTube channel getting lots and lots of visits. And we have lots and lots to talk about. The YouTube channel, by the way, is... You got it, Gerard at large. So we got a lot to talk about today. It's been a busy, busy day. Actually been a busy, busy week. And the stuff that's come out this week has been nothing short of shocking. And not just about the coronavirus, don't you know, but also uh, in conjunction with the Russia hoax that uh, is going to, I think, start to lead to people being perpetrated walked in orange suits uh, doing the frog march, as it were, and we're going to get to that too. Also, we're going to talk about not just the coronavirus, but how it's affecting the city of Manchester and the state of New Hampshire. And the evidence is mounting, by the way, uh, that perhaps all of these lockdowns that we have uh, been placed in really haven't had the effect that uh, we were told they were going to have. I'm not sure where to start. Do we start with, let's start with some non-coronavirus things. And uh, we'll, we'll go to that first. First, uh, yes, so I wanna share screen. I'm getting better at this, right? I've noticed people have been following suit. So uh, yeah, okay, so let's share this. That is General Michael Flynn, President Trump's first national security advisor. And now his attorney is starting to release documents that show he was set up from the beginning. The FBI actually planned a perjury trap for Flynn. And by the way, one of the things I'm going to do when I post this video is I'm gonna take the links of everything that I share with you today, and I'm gonna put them in comments under the video on the YouTube page. So you will have to go to the YouTube page. I may do it on the Facebook page. I just don't wanna be doing it in multiple places, and this will be easier. I might even figure out how to insert links into the video that you can click and watch. Uh, but with so much censoring going on, both on Facebook and YouTube, God only knows what I post and whether or not it will continue to uh, uh, be allowed. And not for nothing, there was a little um, pandemic war gaming that went on in New York City uh, just weeks before this pandemic broke. And I'm not suggest uh, suggesting that there's any kind of conspiracy. But one of the things that they war gamed on if, uh, in the event of a pandemic was how, uh, you know, what would need to happen with the banks, what would need to happen with communication, what would need to happen on social media, et cetera, et cetera. And if you take a look, uh, Glenn Beck did a rather uh, amazing uh, expose on this. But if you take a look at what so much of what's happened between the lockdowns, Google, Facebook, and other social media, uh, uh, wiping out people's posts in favor of things that are credible, like the World Health Organization, et cetera, et cetera, becoming censors for all intent and purpose, which, by the way, raises an issue that we're just going to tickle right now, and that is Google, Facebook, most social media platforms, Twitter, they claim to be platforms, and in claiming to be platforms, they get specific protection from the federal government. A platform is a place where somebody can go and post whatever they want and the platform, uh, the provider of the platform, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, whatever, um, is agnostic as to the content. In other words, they don't edit, they don't censor. What gets put out there gets put out there. 
Now, the difference between a platform and a, and, uh, and a non-platform is when you get into editing, when you get into censorship, when you get into determining what can and cannot be published. So you have a platform and then you have a publisher. Facebook, Google, Twitter, and many other social media outlets are not acting as platforms. They are acting as publishers. And if they're going to do that, that's fine. But what they really should do then is have their platform protection pulled and they should be liable uh, for the content that they allow because they are determining what is and is not allowable as publishers would do, not as a platform would do. And not for nothing, by the way, I'm investigating an alternative social media that I enjoy, uh, that I invite you to take a look at. It's called minds.com. That's M I N D S.com. I will uh, publish a link underneath the video uh, at YouTube. Minds.com, where no such censorship is taking place. So, minds.com is uh, uh, provided as a platform by people who are not into censorship. And frankly, I find a lot of the posting there to be rather thoughtful in any event. All right, so now we're back to what's happening. General Michael Flynn, this is uh, one of many articles that are out there. He's gonna get pardoned by the president and he should. And if I were the president, I'd find a way to bring him back into the administration. And uh, since there do seem to be some vacancies in the administration, I'm sure there's a place for General Flynn. Perhaps he should be uh, one of President Trump's national security advisors. That's why he was originally hired, don't you know? But here's the thing that's disturbing, and I'm gonna just get to the highlight. If you see this, and I'm gonna try to zoom in. It's right here. Oh, it's bringing me to Twitter. I didn't actually expect it was going to do that. So let's take a look. These are handwritten notes by the attorney for the FBI, James Baker, and squared off in red here is, what is our goal? Truth, admission, or to get him to lie so we can prosecute him or get him fired. That is coming out of your Federal Bureau of Investigation. And when Trump talks about the dirty cops, like James Comey, and there's a link here to an interview that Comey gave where he admitted that they set the guy up. I don't have time to play it, but I again, I'm gonna put this under the video in the comment sections so you can see all of the things. But really, the notes belong to James Baker, reportedly belong to James, reveal the FBI was planning a perjury trap for the retired three-star general as part of their investigation into the now debunked allegation that the Trump campaign colluded with Russia. Even Mueller had to say that there was no evidence of collusion. And what we're going to find is that the president was set up. Uh, guys like uh, Michael Flynn were framed. There was also news about Paul Manafort, which if I can find it, I will, I will put out. But uh, he was framed. This whole thing is a sham. And uh, honestly, folks, you should be very worried that the uh, that federal law enforcement and the prior administration you, uh, use uh, prior administration's use of law enforcement to obtain political objectives by creating false stories, creating lies to damage a political opponent. We in these United States should be very very worried about that. And you know, if I'm Vladimir Putin who I will tell you, I respect as a leader. And I will tell you why, I didn't say I liked the guy. I said I respected the guy. Why do I respect the guy? Because he understands what's in his nation's best interest and he is not shy, nor is he apologetic about pursuing those things that he believes are in his nation's best interest. And I really think that he probably would have rather had Hillary Clinton be president of the United States. I mean, what the hell? She, uh, she got an enormous, like a 10, I think it was about a hundred million dollar contribution from a, a Russian business that's a known front for the Russian government to the Clinton Global Foundation. And after that, she signed off as Secretary of State on all the paperwork necessary to give Russia 20% of the known uranium uh, uh, reserves or, or uh, mines in the United States, right? 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure that uh, the, the, the Russians would have much rather had Hillary Clinton as president. But at the end of the day, I don't really think they cared. I think what the Russians wanted was domestic turmoil caused by their alleged influence in the election. And they've gotten it if for no other reason than you have dumb Democrats who just cannot get beyond their hatred for Donald Trump and are using anything and everything they can and have since the day he was elected to try to get him tossed out of office. They still think that that press conference he held as a candidate was him legitimately asking the Russians to hack Hillary Clinton and come up with the emails that the FBI couldn't find. Anybody would have a brain in their head knew that was a joke, just like anybody would have a brain in their head who watched that uh, press conference where he allegedly encouraged Americans to drink Lysol, which he didn't do, uh, to, to combat the coronavirus. Anybody would have a brain in their head watching that knew what he was doing with that reporter, and the reporter was just so stupid they didn't get it. But I digress. So there are very, very, very big developments um, in um, the Russia hoax story. And unfortunately, it looks like our Federal Bureau of Investigation at the top levels was actually planning a perjury trap for a decorated American hero uh, because he served President, uh, President Trump. Despicable. All right, let's get on to this. Uh, you know, I'm just going to say this. Uh, the Washington Post recently ran a story. Uh, grocery store workers are starting to die from coronavirus. Oh, so let's try to inject a little more panic. Yes, there are four people who have worked at uh, grocery stores across the country who have died as a result of the coronavirus. I will post this discussion. It does link to the article, but this is um, from reason.com. Yeah, they pretty much blew that up. <laughs> but, all right, I do wanna talk about uh, the coronavirus here. Um, and we're gonna move on and we're gonna get more local with the coronavirus. I'm starting national and I'm gonna move local, right? Local being New Hampshire where there are absolutely shocking statistics that if you look at them, you just you have to do a double take and you have to wonder why, given the statistics that we have here in the state, we are, we are going to continue to be under some aggressive form of lockdown um, in, in this state. It makes no sense. And I'm pretty sure you're going to agree with that once you know what the numbers are. Okay, so. As you know, I have raised over and over and over again questions about the efficacy of this lockdown uh, and whether or not it's actually having the desired effect. Of course, the people who have ordered it do say it's having the desired effect. But uh, let's get to um, what started the lockdown. Uh, it was a, a fellow named Ferguson, right? Let me see. His name is here. Don't look at the screen. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Ah. Yeah, anyway, he's a professor of epide Neil Ferguson of epidemiology at the Imperial College in London. This fellow is from Sweden. And you know what? Sweden's kind of taking its hits because what is Sweden doing? It's quarantining the vulnerable. It's, uh, it's quarantining the sick, the contaminated, warning the vulnerable, and letting everybody else go about their business. The, the nation of Sweden has had 2,000 coronavirus deaths at, as of this taping, but people point to the fact that it has not bent its curve. And Sweden's answer is, well, we're not suffering so many cases. I think they have a grand total of like 8,000 cases in the country. We're, we're not seeing so many cases. We're worried about the curve. However, let's just assume that we aren't bending the curve once this runs through our population, we're not worried about the bounce back that you all are warning everyone is coming um, in the fall. So I would look at, I would keep an eye on what's happening in Sweden and happening in the Netherlands because they are the two most prominent countries in the world who are following a very different path than the rest of the world. But the question is, is how did the rest of the world get on this path? 
And the rest of the world got on this path because of a fellow named Neil Ferguson, an alleged epidemiologist um, at the Imperial College in London. And again, I'm going to post this article for you to go and read on your own. It has all of the links that you need to have. And it's, uh, it's actually a fascinating read about what's going on in different strategies. But there are two things that I want to bring to your attention here. Uh, this is uh, an, uh, you know, Professor Johan de Secchi. Well, the only, Sweden, the only Swedish I studied was back in the 80s when the Swedish bikini team was hawking uh, old Milwaukee beer. Remember that? Those of you remember the Swedish bikini team and the old Milwaukee 30 pack tall boys. There we go. I'm dating myself. But uh, he, this, this fellow is a well known uh, epidemiologist in the world. He was Sweden's epidemiologist for, from 1995 to 2005. And then he served as the chief scientific, chief scientist of the European Center for Disease uh, Prevention and Control. So he is a known quantity in the epidemiological world. He is no dope. But he had some very interesting things to say. And one of the things, again, I'm, I'm going to avoid all of the particular criticisms. But one of the things that I have been screeching about is this. Ferguson's paper. We're going to talk about the impact of Ferguson's paper, which was never published scientifically. It's not peer-reviewed, which, which a scientific paper should be. It's just an internal departmental report from Imperial, and it's fascinating. I don't think any other scientific endeavor has made such an impression on the world uh, as that rather debatable paper. So you might recall that once upon a time, Britain was embarking on the same uh, path as Sweden and the Netherlands. They basically were going to quarantine the sick, warn the elderly and other vulnerable populations to stay home, warn those that were exposed to those folks to stay home, and uh, let everybody else go about their business. In Great Britain, the internal, uh, the initial government policy on May 2 was to pursue a herd immunity strategy, which is exactly what Sweden and the Netherlands are doing. Uh, against the coronavirus, but on March 16th, Ferguson gave a 20-page paper to UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson that predicted 510,000 people would die by that strategy. One week later, the British government changed course, instituting a suppression strategy. So, a little bit more about the papers of Mr. Ferguson. Business Insider noted in 2009, one of Ferguson's models predicted 65,000 people could die from the swine flu in the UK. That final figure was below 500. And by the way, there was no quarantining, shutdown, or anything else uh, in the swine flu, which I think is pretty much as widespread as uh, uh, the coronavirus, if not more so. 61 million people in the United States got the swine flu. Anyway, Business Insider also noted Michael Thursfield, a professor of veterinary epidemiology at Edinburgh, uh, Edinburgh University, told the paper he had deja vu after reading the Imperial paper, saying Ferguson was responsible for excessive animal culling during the 2001 foot and mouth outbreak Ferguson warned the government that 150,000 people could die. Six million animals were slaughtered as a precaution, costing the country billions in farming revenue. In the end, 200 people died. So, um, oh, some people ripped Ferguson for reportedly overestimating the potential death toll in the 2005 bird flu or, uh, outbreak. Ferguson allegedly estimated 200 million could die, but the actual total was reported less than 1,000. So in other words, this guy has got a history of being a complete idiot when it comes to this, but the money shot on all of this stuff is simply this, okay? The paper was never published scientifically. It's not peer reviewed, which a scientific paper should be. It's just an internal department report from, the, from Imperial, and it's fascinating. I don't think any other scientific endeavor has made such an impression on the world as that rather debatable paper said Swedish profess, a Swedish professor who was their state epidemiolo epidemiologist and the chief scientific 
the chief scientist of the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. Yeah. And um, not for nothing, I have been all along, as you know, saying, who are the morons who looked at this paper and took it as gospel truth instead of demonstrating a little scientific curiosity, if not skepticism, at the assumptions? And please, don't tell me, oh, we did such a great job social distancing and shutting everything down that it saved lives. Yeah, no, it didn't. There's another paper that recently came out by a fellow named Lyman Stone. Who is Lyman Stone? Scrolling down really quickly. Lyman Stone, it's a long article, is the chief information officer at the popu oops, population, uh, here we go, at the population consulting firm Demographic Intelligence, a research fellow at the Institute for Family Studies and an adjunct fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, he, his wife, and their baby daughter live in Hong Kong. The purpose of this article and the reason why I'm bringing it to your attention is he takes direct aim at things he says are working and things that are not working. And one of the things that he has is this really interesting gra uh, 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 graph showing the typical change in death rates around a lockdown for um, various, uh, uh, for Sweden and the Netherlands, and then sort of like the world as a whole with the mortality spike, low range, high range, uh, adjusting for missing days or for weekly daily data, Spain, Italy, Portugal, Denmark, Germany, UK, France, gonna move my picture here, Switzerland, New York, and New Jersey. And what he does is he very methodically goes through all of the different things that are happening out there in the world with respect to this. And he's showing, quite frankly, that um, Everybody who says that the lockdowns are the reason why we're bending the curve, he believes are wrong, and he explains it in great detail, but the thrust of this article is basically this, folks. What he says is, what the evidence shows, is that it takes, you know, from, from diagnosis, uh, from infection to, um, oh, I'm going to get all of, okay, as luck would have it. At this point, enough research has been done that it's possible to say with some confidence about how long it takes to die of COVID. Across numerous medical studies, COVID has reliably been found to take anywhere from two to 10, day, two to 10 days to incubate, but most usually four to six, and anywhere from 12 to 24 days to kill a person after incubation. Across all studies, these estimate, uh, these estimate, uh, these estimate places typically uh, uh, the typical death time at about 20 to 25 days after first exposure. And that's of, you know, the percent, obviously that's only of the people who pass away because certainly not any, not everybody passes away, not even close. So what he says is when you take a look at the, 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 the death rates and as they start to come down, they come down too close to when the lockdowns and the stay at home orders were imposed and the businesses were shut down for it to prove that they worked. In other words, the test proves, uh, the, the lockdowns prove the opposite because the curves are bending within a couple weeks of the lockdown, but if it takes three weeks on average for someone who is infected to pass away, how can it be that something done two weeks before is responsible for bending the curve? The answer is, it can't, it, it's mathematically not possible. And so he actually does a pretty good job going measure by measure. What works, what doesn't work. He says max, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an easy read, uh, especially if you're a non-scientist and it's got links more than what you know what to do with. He even goes to the Bible. Centralized quarantine orders were individuals who test positive or individuals who have contact with COVID infected people are forced to be quarantined for seven, 14, or 21 days in hotels or special purpose spaces are uh, an extremely effective way to fight disease. In fact, this is how Moses in Leviticus, that's a book in the Bible for those of you who aren't sure, uh, commands the Israelites to combat infectious disease and it's the strategy used to keep COVID at bay here in Hong Kong where I live too. 
Centralized quarantines dramatically restrict the liberties of a small share of the population in order to afford some degree of normalcy to the vast majority. What's he saying here? Now, if you take a look at Hong Kong, Hong Kong has had almost no incidence of coronavirus despite being just off the, uh, the Chinese mainland. And what he's saying is if someone's inf infected, they isolate that person and they isolate just about any person they can find that that person has had contact with during the period of time where they may have been contagious. And they let everybody else go about their business. Why? Because quarantining everybody uh, has a cost that we're not calculating. There was one study that I talked to you about last week, uh, that website um, that I brought to your attention last week, which I probably should go back and put under that in a comment section. But anyway, uh, it said, you know, if Texas opens too early, uh, an additional 400 people could die of COVID-19. But it also said if Texas doesn't open uh, when it was planning to open, that the, the projections were another 900 deaths due to suicide. And what we're seeing across the country are skyrocketing suicide rates. I have a friend who is telling me that uh, one of her son's teenaged friends, they're, they're uh, 17 year old boys, um, is, you know, he comes over, hangs out. Oh my God, people are going to other people's houses. Ah! Uh, but he doesn't talk. He plays video games and he doesn't talk. He's not the same kid. And it's been this way since the, uh, the apple cart got tossed off a cliff uh, to protect everybody. And it's, it, it, it's crazy. We are seeing mass cases of anxiety and depression. We're seeing really big spikes in suicide. We're seeing spikes in drug use. Uh, we're seeing all kinds of domestic violence. You name it, uh, we're seeing it as a result of people being disallowed to go about their normal everyday lives because of one knucklehead with a study that scared the world into shutting down. And apparently a knucklehead that's got quite a history of enormously dire projections on just about every epidemic that uh, was projected to hit the planet. And as you saw, he has been frightfully wrong on all of them. So that is going to help us get uh, more local here in the state of New Hampshire. Let's take a look at the map and I'm going to say up front, I, I realize that I have an issue seeing the map in real time. Um, for some reason, the colors that I can't see, which are the, the zero in the one to four are colors that come out when I watch the replay. So I'm not gonna comment on any areas that may or may not have uh, coronavirus because the state's map is terrible and they use very faint uh, and hard to distinguish colors, but they make the same point, right? If you got one case, what, what's the point? But what the state's doing now is any community that's got more than five cases, like here in say Bartlett, New Hampshire, right there, Bartlett, five cases, eight cases, in Grafton County, you've got, oh, in Carroll County. So in Coas County, you do not have a community with more than four cases. In Grafton County, Hanover and Lebanon, where? Dartmouth-Hitchcock uh, Hospital is. Uh, let me see, in Carroll County, you've got three communities with five or more cases, Bartlett, Conway, Wolfboro, Belknap County, Laconia with eight, Guilford with seven, Merrimack County. Oh, Sullivan County. Nothing more than five. Cheshire County. Seven in Keene, five in Swansea, six in Jaffrey, six in Ringe. Merrimack County. Franklin, 19. Hold on that 19. Concord, 44. Bow, eight. Hooksit, 22. Pembroke, six. Allenstown, 10. Epsom, six. Stratford County. Well, Okay, Stratford, Rockingham, Hillsborough. Now you're starting to see sort of the epicenter of the, uh, of the uh, epidemic. And if you follow from Concord through Hooksett, Manchester, Londonderry, Wyndham, Salem, and the communities on either side, where are you? It's the 93 corridor. Yes, it is. Anyway, here's the point, folks. Um, 
you know, the governor in his press conference yesterday, which was Wednesday, the 29th, was talking about a gradual flexed opening of the state of New Hampshire. And shock and surprise, they are coming to the conclusion that one of the areas that we can flex open are the hospitals. We're gonna talk about that in a second because I guess they're figuring out that all of the hospital vacancies they've created by ordering the hospitals not to do anything other than emergency or otherwise necessary procedures, uh, costing them $200 million a month in revenue, causing thousands to be laid off across the state, threatening at least two hospitals with closure. I guess they've decided that was a bad plan. Yes, oh, I know, we had to prepare for the wave. We had to, it was gonna come, it was gonna hit us. I, it was almost like watching a weather report. I mean, how many times do we turn on Channel 9 News or whatever it is, and we get these dire predictions of, of snowstorms, ice storms, whatever it are coming. Everyone panics, which blows my mind, having lived in New Hampshire my whole life. The idea of a snowstorm means we should blow out grocery stores. Oh, my head. Okay, and then only to have the chuckling meteorologist go, wow, we dodged a bullet at the last minute. It took a big U-turn and the three feet of snow we were projecting came, turned out to be three inches. <gasps> Woo! And we all go, oh yeah, isn't that great? And we take a look around at all the stuff that we we're gonna buy and stuff into a refrigerator that we didn't, weren't gonna be able to keep cold because we were gonna lose power or be stuck for days or whatever. It's just, it's, it's crazy. So, Here's what the state map is looking at. So on the 29th, the governor said, oh, well, we'll probably flex open that. But that was the only hint that he gave about what he might do. Uh, and so as we take a look at what might be happening here in the state of New Hampshire, I'm going to jump and I'm going to save what I consider to be la pièce de la résistance for last. And that is a real deep dive into the numbers. Um, but what, what are we looking at doing? Hey, the Democrats, this from the union leader, gotta love the Democrats, right? They're offering their spending priorities for the $1.25 billion that the uh, Superior Court in the state of New Hampshire said, uh, sorry, your lawsuit against the governor is being tossed because under law, you do not have standing, which means they have no, uh, no cause to bring the case. Yes but they're still acting like they um, have authority over this money, but they released this great big thing. And uh, on what they, their priorities as Democrats are for the, um, for, for the money. Yes, okay. Well, they want money to go to communities, counties, healthcare providers, and small businesses. Isn't that nice? But the largest would use 250 million to reimburse the state for COVID-19 spending. I wonder how much of that will go to what former Democratic State Committee Chair Kathy Sullivan said uh, in an op-ed in the Union Leader we covered last week uh, to keep uh, the state employees who are not actually going to work every day on the payroll. Uh-huh, yes. <laughs> ah, my head. All right, so let's... Um, Oh, and she mentions it. We didn't lose the case on the merits. We lost because we didn't have standing to bring suit. That means we lack, in, that doesn't mean we lack a role in the process. Actually, under the way the state, and we can debate the merit of the state law that gives the governor as broad a grant of, uh, of authority as it gives, but the state law <clears throat> pretty much says the gov's in charge in these situations. So workforce incentives proposed. The plan has a hundred million dollar workforce component the first half would provide hazard pay and retention payment for frontline workers, including healthcare, law enforcement, and essential retail workers, such as those working at grocery stores. So we're going to, I mean, look, it, healthcare workers, re, even retail workers, but certainly police, fire, all of these folks go to hazardous jobs every day. Is their job really more hazardous today than it was uh, before the coronavirus? I think that's, I think that's uh, up for discussion. The second half would pay uh, for computer systems upgrades to the Department of Employment Security, which has seen a record surge in jobless claims. I'm pretty sure the state needs to upgrade its computer capacity, but is now that, is this the money to $50 million to do that? Okay, 
Susie says that part of the grant could also be used for the state to maintain the $600 per week bonus payments for all the unemployed through September if Congress ends the federal benefits sooner. So we've got people in the state of New Hampshire, oh, it's, uh, I think it's 175,000 now, not for nothing, because of this uh, pandemic of panic, 30 million people. 30 million people have lost their jobs. I'm going to do some math. Okay, we had 160 million people working out of about 165. So five divided by 160. Um, um, 5 million. That's a big number. Okay, so we had about a 3% unemployment rate. Now, um, we don't have 160 million people working. We have 130 million people working. So that means our unemployment rate, if you want to figure this out, you're going to take uh, 35, because there were 5 million people in the job market before, right? So, so 35 million people divided by 165 million people is we, congratulations, we now have an unemployment rate in the United States that is over 20%. It's qu more than quintupled. It's about quintupled since this panic hit. It's quintupled in six weeks. Now, it wasn't all that long ago where I read an article in the new Union Leader, I think it was, where uh, Dick Anagnost, local businessman of some repute, was uh, complaining that he's trying to bring various of his workers back to some of his many companies, but they're not coming back because they're making more on unemployment than they are making working for him. And since the average unemployment check on New Hampshire unemployment is $400 and the feds are throwing another 600 bucks on top of it, they're making a thousand bucks a week to stay home. And Donna Susi thinks it's a great idea for the state to extend, if the federal government doesn't, the 600 bucks a week on top of the state unemployment so that people can continue to stay home. In my opinion, if your employer calls you back and says it's time to go to work uh, and you say no, cut off the benefits because the way the federal government has written it now, they're going to get that 600 bucks for four months, whether they go to, you know, whether they're called back or not. And that's not right. There should not be a financial incentive for people to stay home. But let's take a look at some of the other things the Democrats want to do. They want to spend $40 million to build out broadband across the state. 10 million to enhance the use of telemedicine and healthcare practices, and 10 million to enhance, quote, remote government operations at the state and community levels. What the hell does that mean? To enhance remote government operations? Look, I'm all for using remote technology when you need to, but make no mistake, remote technology makes it a whole lot more difficult for the public to hold its elected officials accountable and it, uh, it should not be allowed to stand. So these are the Democrats' priorities for the $1.25 billion that have been sent by the feds to the state of New Hampshire. And uh, there you go. Now, on to, oh, but, okay. So keeping it on the state level, I gave you a little teaser there. More parks and beaches could open to a radically different experience in New Hampshire. Oh, now one of the reasons why the governor is being, in my opinion, overly cautious is he says he's worried that if he starts opening up New Hampshire, then people from Massachusetts are going to flood across the border and they're so infected down there, it's terrible. I agree that it needs to be taken into account. I really do. But in his press conference yesterday, the governor also said that he would be concerned about opening up, say, Coas County, because there might be throngs of people who come from other areas in the state to go have dinner or hang out at a park or a hotel or something in Coas County. I mean, how far does it, I mean, the ripple effect of this is, is terrible, it's killing everything. So it's gonna be interesting to see what the governor allows um, to start to reopen in their phased in approach to uh, restarting New Hampshire's economy. And not for nothing, folks, I am not in the camp that says this is going to be one of those V-shaped recoveries. I am very much in the camp that a lot of people are going to lose their businesses. 
The phase-in approach is going to make it virtually impossible for a number of businesses to viably open. How does a restaurant open if it can only, uh, uh, only seat 25% of its capacity? You know, I've worked in restaurants, folks. I understand how those things work, as does anybody who's worked in a restaurant. How do you do that operating at 25% capacity? Seems to me that's a bit of a dicey proposition, and I think you're going to see a lot of places stay closed, or you're going to see them maybe call back an employee or two rather than their whole complement. That's certainly not going to help the economy launch. Uh, and then there is the psychological scarring that's been created by people totally freaked out that they're going to get this thing and die. We're going to get to those numbers in just a minute. Um, and I think you're just going to see a lot of people stay home. And even if they wanted to leave, not everybody's getting those $600 payments. Not every business is going to be open. There is going to be a severe, in my opinion, cash flow shortage in most families. A another friend of mine right? She's working part-time. The husband got laid off. He got one week of unemployment before he got called back. He's making half of what he was making before. Their mortgage company has given them a hard time because they've fallen behind on their bills. And somehow we are not recognizing that this is not just happening to people that I know. It's happening on a widespread basis. I'm sorry if you're trying to get caught up on your mortgage payments, your electric bill, or whatever it is, you're not going out to dinner you're not going on a family vacation. You're not gonna do a lot of the discretionary spending kinds of things that really drive an economy. It's just not going to happen. And God only knows when these folks are gonna see their jobs return to normal because many of them work for so-called you know, non-essential businesses. And by the way, the employment, unemployment numbers this, uh, uh, from this week are showing that essential businesses are being badly damaged by this now too. 30, more than 30 million of our fellow Americans are out of work in six weeks because of this pandemic. 175,000, give or take, of our fellow Granite Staters. That is almost double the number of people who used to drive to Massachusetts every day to go to work before this pandemic hit. That's roughly, uh, our unemployment rate has got to be now around 20%, just like the rest of the nation. It's horrible. In any event, okay, so getting back here. So now uh, we're talking about rules for state parks. You can no longer, uh, if, if the governor allows them to be open, if the governor allows them to be open, then you're gonna have to go online and make a reservation. And if you are not allowed because too many people wanna go to the park, then you will not be allowed to go to a state park. Isn't that fascinating? Reser see, reservations required. And I'm sure there will be ample number. Last weekend, 533 visitors hiked Mount Monadnock while more than 200 others were turned down. So now, apparently, <coughs> we have to control the state parks the way uh, grocery stores or other places are controlling access to their buildings. So. <laughs> You know, you go to, I mean, what is it, a 100,000 square foot building at, uh, uh, at, at BJ's, the old Sam's Club down on John Devine Drive. You can only allow 600 people in the building at any one time to ensure proper distancing. Uh, I get news for you folks. Anybody who pays attention. And uh, how many people are following the arrows? You know, I kind of gave the business to somebody at a local grocery store, walking around with the masks, all afraid, but going the opposite direction of the arrows. I was going the direction of the arrows because I am considerate of my fellow, uh, my fellow human beings. So I looked at the guy and I said, if you're so concerned about the coronavirus that you're wearing a mask, why aren't you following the arrows that are in place to make sure we're all properly social distanced and not going you know, across each other where there isn't enough room to do that? And he said, I didn't see it. I mean, he was literally standing on top of one of the arrows. Come on, dude, you didn't see it? And then he said, oh, well, I don't really care about the mask. My wife made me wear it. I'm like, oh. Anyway, this is what's happening out there in the real world. So now we're gonna control the state parks the way grocery stores are controlling the number of people who are in them at any one time. Uh, we're gonna force people to go and, uh, oh yes, we're gonna force people to go and um, register in advance uh, or, or they can't go to a state park. Okay, 
Sununu stay at home order changes coming Friday. Yes. And what he said in that press conference, by the way, was to expect the, um, the stay at home order to be around for a long time, but uh, with more flexible caveats, like letting hospitals not go out of business by treating people. They have plenty of capacity. He said it. He said, we got thousands of beds, but only a couple hundred. Mm hmm. Governors, Massachusetts, Maine, more aid to the homeless. Yeah, let's talk about uh, let's talk about that in a minute. So, six more COVID nineteen deaths, two new outbreaks at long term care sites. I want to show you a couple things here. This graph is very telling. The dark blue are the number of people who tested positive for COVID nineteen. The light blue are the number of people who tested not uh, who, who tested negative for COVID nineteen on any of the given days down here. And what's that, what that's telling you, first of all, the three-day average of the number of positives is, is going way down, right? But um, look at it, what is it, 85, 90% of the people being tested? And, and in New Hampshire, this is important because only high-risk people, right? Your frontline workers, your healthcare workers, people suspected of having the virus, really, those are the only people who are being tested. So if 85 or 90%, just eyeballing it here, if 85 or 90% of the people being tested every day are turning up negative, what's that telling you about the, the prevalence of this virus? I don't know what it's telling you, but I know what it's telling me. So the funny thing here is, okay, so on this day, 50 new cases of coronavirus were announced in the state of New Hampshire. But, Shivanet said she's the, the DHHS person, okay? Shivanet said there were 50 new cases of the novel corona, it's the Wuhan coronavirus, thank you, pushing the statewide total to 2,054 and two new outbreaks in long-term care facilities. The new outbreaks were at Hackett Hill Center in Manchester with 22 residents and two staff, that's 24, testing positive, and Mountain Ridge Center in Franklin with 13 residents and two staff with the virus. So that's another 15, 15 and 24 is 39. 39 of the 50 cases in the state of New Hampshire on one day were from nursing homes. And I remember doing this with you last week where there were what, I think 70 cases uh, on that day and uh, 40 of them came from three long-term care facilities in the state of New Hampshire. Now we read one more paragraph and it's the most telling of all. According to the information released on Wednesday by DHHS, over 63% of those who've died from COVID-19 in New Hampshire are connected to a facility where a known outbreak has occurred. In other words, of the 66 people who have lost their lives to this disease, and again, we restate our objection to how these deaths are being counted because if you had a heart attack and also had COVID-19, they would list it as a COVID-19 death, not a heart attack. That's wrong, folks. But that's how the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, is requiring these deaths be counted. So that means 44 of the 66 people who've died in New Hampshire have been in nursing homes. It's, not, it's, it's worth noting that many people in nursing homes have what are called DNRs or do not resuscitate orders. So who knows whether or not they could have lived had they they'd been aggressively inter, uh, intervened with. So now we know that 63% of all of the deaths, and I would be willing to say based on the evidence that have, I can piece together from news reports, that at least half, if not more than half the cases in the state of New Hampshire. Remember I told you, keep an eye on Franklin. Franklin had 19. 13 of them are in this one nursing facility. Really? So do we have a problem in Franklin or do we have a problem with a building in Franklin? We have a problem with a building in Franklin, folks. If anybody should be quarantined, it should be the people who are vulnerable and, uh, and the, 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 uh, the workers who interact with them. How about that? Maybe they shouldn't be allowed to go out about the public however they want. Just saying. So if, and in Massachusetts, where everyone's totally freaked out, including our governor, uh, over the, uh, the, you know, what's going on in Massachusetts, uh, two days ago, I saw a report where it said 56% of the people who've died in Massachusetts have died in nursing homes, which means 
you got to believe that at least half the cases in the Bay State are coming out of similar long-term care facilities. So what we have, and the irony of this is, and we've said it before, we'll say it again, the irony of that is this, okay? The places with the most stringent controls on who gets in and who gets out and under what circumstances are the places where this, the, this virus is running wild. It's not hammering the general population. It's just not. Um, and even if it were, I, I show you Sweden, but you know, we're so damn determined to make it everybody's problem. You've got this article here in the union leader this week, police cracking down as surfers make waves amid beach closures, surfers. The police chief in Rye is pissed off. Rye police chief Kevin Walsh has threatened to charge surfers who continue to defy no parking rules, as well as the executive order issued by Governor Chris Sununu last month. He said they could be charged with a violation under town ordinance and face a $62 fine. They continue to do what they want. At some point, they need to know you're going to get a ticket and go to court because you're ignoring it. They're really not thinking of everybody. It's disappointing, he said. Question, to whom are the surfers going to give the coronavirus? Oh, that's one thing I wanted to get back to, you know, the governor and, and opening up these, uh, you know, this, this, this article here um, about uh, how things are gonna be different. You might be able to walk on a beach, but God forbid you cluster with your family on the beach, being six or 10 or any feet away. They might let you swim, they might let you walk, but they are not gonna let you gather. They're not gonna let you talk. They're gonna move you along. So we're getting to a point where we can take a walk on the beach, but uh, you know, the same family that you're cooped up with at home, if you're together with them on the beach, you're going to, that is, you are, and now you've got the police chief in Rye. All right, they're parking in violation of an order fine, put a ticket, but you're talking seriously, talking about arresting people for going surfing? I'm sorry, I can't tell. Maybe these, maybe these guys aren't six feet apart from each other. Kind of hard to tell, but I'm pretty sure they're not gonna give the fish coronavirus. Unbelievable. And while we're at it, I've got to, uh, can I, well this, I don't know what you're seeing here. So I'm gonna stop the share for just a second. Share screen. I wanna put this up. This is what's hanging on tennis courts around the Queen City. Uh, this one particularly annoys me because this tennis court, tennis court is named for my grandfather, Frank Churris, who is a masterful multi-time state uh, tennis champion here in New Hampshire. But uh, now playing tennis, not allowed in the city of Manchester because playing tennis um, is going to spread the coronavirus. The hard courts, hard courts are closed because tennis is going to kill you with the coronavirus. Back to the Queen City. Uh, shares, oops, that's the wrong one. Stand by. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. Oh, there it is. I'm pressing the wrong button. Share screen. So back to our, our, our what's in the news on the coronavirus thing. I, no, we did that one, we did that one. I think it's right here, boom. Coronavirus in Manchester, as if the liberals needed another excuse to uh, not only not deal with, but allow the homeless problem to grow. I give you Manchester's answer with the help of the state of New Hampshire. They are now facilitating the development of homeless camps uh, around and under the Amiskeg Bridge, right by the State Armory, and down on the Granite State, uh, the Granite Street Bridge, the Amiskeg Bridge, and the Granite Street Bridge. They're bringing in porta potties. They're bringing in water. They're bringing in all kinds of facilities, and they're allowing the people to pitch their tents. The state is actually paying for this. The state came up with three million bucks. They're putting up fencing. They're creating uh, uh, tent communities. They're cleaning it all up for people. They're putting extra police down. They're putting in all kinds of water. And, 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 uh, and the mayor sent out a letter today saying, oh, don't worry, it's only temporary, really. But what the mayor didn't say is what the city is going to do when the uh, emergency is declared over, which you know it won't be for months anyway. Uh, and the reason for this, of course, is 
well, the homeless are not going to the shelters because they're afraid they're going to get the virus and the shelters aren't taking them anyway because they have to have proper social distancing for everybody. Even though they've converted the old St. Casimir School and the old Angie's Place into homeless, you know, emergency homeless shelters, there's just not enough capacity. But the mayor says, we're following the CDC guidelines because the Center for Disease Control says if we get rid of these camps, the people, my God, they could, they could go places and give people the disease. And maybe they can and maybe they will, but I'm not sure a, a guy, a homeless guy walking up the street by my house is going to give me the coronavirus. And not for nothing, they're doing more testing of people who are homeless than they are doing testing of those of us who are actually paying for all of this testing, um, but not able to get it. Although the governor has relaxed some of that now. And so if your doctor gives you a prescription, you can go somewhere presumably and get a test. There are five centers that are now opening around the state, except none of them are anywhere near Manchester. And maybe you can go to Convenient MD, which is doing the testing for the state, but there isn't one in Manchester. And who knows what's going on for testing in Manchester. But we do know now that the city, with the help of the state at its request, is not only allowing, but facilitating the development of tent cities around the Amiskeg and Granite Street bridges because of the COVID-19 virus. And finally, I wanna to get to this really interesting map. I think I have time. I do, I have about three minutes and I gotta wait for this thing to go back. Channel 9 has actually got a, uh, did I do that? I did that. Channel 9 has actually got a uh, very good, oh no, I hope I didn't close it. All right, so share screen, back, go. Channel 9 has actually got a very interesting um, set of maps on its website, and I encourage you to take a look at it, because one of the things that we keep hearing, right, and I clicked on this, I don't know what the answer to this is, why do the numbers not add up? Okay, this is the number of daily cases of the coronavirus, the number of new cases announced every day. This is the number of new people hospitalized every day. And this is the number of deaths every day. So New Hampshire's worst death day was what? Uh, seven people? Okay, uh, 99 cases. And this was a day, if I recall correctly, there were a whole lot of, um, whatchamacallit, nursing homes uh, that were, so now, so you can follow it. You can see that the, it's very inconsistent. And I think a part of that is the, the way the state of New Hampshire is testing. Now they've got this um, uh, total count, right? So this is good because this is current. This tells you the number of people who currently, according to the state, have the coronavirus. So while you see we have um, 2,054 New Hampshireites infected, well, what we know is that as of April 29th, oh, we only have a thousand people in the state of New Hampshire who, have affected, who are infected. Everyone else, you know, all but 66 of them recovered, recovered. And we'll take a look at the number of hospitalizations. So as of April 29th, there were 107 people in New Hampshire hospitals because of the COVID-19 virus, okay? But if you go to the cumulative totals, boy, doesn't this look terrible, right? Well, this is a good number. This is the 980 people who've recovered. This is the total of 259 people who have been uh, hospitalized. And this is the 66 uh, total in, in, uh, in death. Now, hopefully the state is gonna start releasing more demographic information on the people infected and the death. There was a question by, oh, I, I wrote it down. Uh, I'll have to go back and watch it, but uh, it, was a, it was an online, uh, website. It was an online media site. It was not a New Hampshire site. But uh, Lori Shibanet, the Director of Health and Human Services, was asked a very pointed question about why New Hampshire releases so little demographics. Like, for example, they only tell you if the person was above or below 60, if they're infected or they pass away or whatever the case is. They don't tell you what the other health conditions the person may have been suffering from uh, are. They don't tell you they don't tell you anything, right? So hopefully we're gonna see this, but when you get to the current number of cases, right, the point was made, you know, we'd like to know where the hotspots are. We'd like to know who's really vulnerable and who's really not. And they're saying, well, you know, outside of complaining about the amount of man hours it would take to produce that data, they're, they're looking at ways to share more. So currently, as of yesterday, 1,008 people in the state of New Hampshire have coronavirus. 
a vast number of those are in uh, long-term care facilities. And out of the hundreds, if not thousands of vacant hospital beds in the state of New Hampshire right now, we have 107 people there for the coronavirus. Folks, if these numbers don't start driving home the point that this overreaction and the harm it's causing economically, socially, and health-wise, right? How many people, and that's something Ferguson's model never took into account, right? How many people um, are, are sick or dead today because they couldn't get the, the care that they otherwise would have gotten because of the coronavirus and everything that's going on? How many people, drugs, everything else? How many people, right? We need to start paying attention and we need to start understanding that if more than half of your infections and nearly two thirds of your deaths are coming from long term care facilities, I don't think letting me go to get a haircut or out to dinner or otherwise return to my life and you return to your life is going to cause any more death. We need to start taking a look at the places where these infections are and talking about how we restrict access to those places and how we allow those who go into those places to have access outside of them to areas where perhaps they're getting the disease and perhaps they're not. Maybe they're getting it from the facility. Who knows? But the approach we're taking is not working and it has gone well beyond the point where it's worse than the cure. I am your ever humble host, Rich Gerard. Thanks for tuning in. Until next week, where we'll be live in the studio with absolutely no changes to the procedures that were in place before we were kicked out of the studio. Uh, be good, be well, don't do anything we wouldn't do. We're proud to have in the audience. Thanks as always for being there. Good night.